Hello, everyone. This is video number six in the Life of Christ series. This is Pastor Bob Cornell, and I hope that you're having a wonderful day. In this video, we're going to be dealing with the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus preach? Uh, is Jesus still the preacher? We're going to be dealing with that today, and I believe it's going to be a help to you and encouragement to your faith. Well, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to this Cornell Ministries YouTube channel. Press the thumbs up. Uh, share it with someone else if you would like. But you know, my purpose in doing these videos is to get the Word of God and the knowledge of God's Word out to as many people as possible. And we function completely 100% on a donation basis. So if you are able to give, we would greatly appreciate it. You can see the information on the screen there, cornerministries.com, or you can text to give to that number on the screen. All right, well, let's get into it. I'm going to put it on the screen screen here. You'll see it and put myself in the corner. Uh, I'm going to come from Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, and in, because in those verses, it gives us really the three main things that Jesus' earthly ministry consisted of. As you can see the note on the screen, Jesus' ministry consisted of three things. Preaching ministry, which is proclaiming the word, teaching, which is explaining the word, and then healings and miracles, which are a result of the word. But let's read it out of Matthew chapter 4. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon possessed epileptics, that is mental disorders, and paralytics, that's muscular disorders, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. You'll see that I emphasize those three words, teaching, preaching, and healing. And Matthew chapter 4 was written at the very beginning of Jesus' three and a half years of earthly ministry. So Jesus, he began doing this. He began by teaching. He began by preaching. And he began by healing. And those three things continued all the way throughout his three and a half years of ministry. All right, so what I'm going to focus on in this video is the preaching ministry of Jesus, which in a nutshell means to proclaim the word. But I'm going to break it down some more. You can see the notes on the screen there. Preaching in the New Testament, the main Greek word for preaching is the Greek word keruso. And it means to publicly proclaim, to herald, to announce. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus preached throughout his entire ministry in Matthew chapter 4 and in Mark chapter 1, other chapters early in the Gospels. When he first began, he began by preaching. And I'm going to show you some scriptures that, that tell us that his preaching ministry was at the beginning it was in the middle, and it was at the very end of his ministry. Now, a note there I put on the screen as well is this, is that Jesus is still the preacher, teacher, and miracle worker. Like Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 says, it says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we can count on Jesus, and he uses, of course, his Holy Spirit to do it in us, but he's, he's, he's still the preacher, the teacher, and the miracle worker. And I wanted to emphasize that point to you. But let's take a look at some scriptures here. Okay, we already looked at Matthew chapter 4 at the very beginning. Now, a little bit later on, in Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Uh, then in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, and I'll take myself off the screen here, but it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases, and he sent them to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread nor the, neither money, neither have two coats apiece, and whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, 
preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, Luke chapter 9, that was around the year point of Jesus' earthly ministry. All right, I want to take a look at some more uh, scriptures. In Luke chapter 20, this is getting towards the end. It says, And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders. All right, Luke 24, verse 47. This is at the very end of Jesus' ministry. And it says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So, again, I've already made the point, but I'll say it again, that Jesus was a preacher from the very beginning of his ministry to the very end and all the way in between. So, again, preaching, it means to publicly herald. It means to announce. And, you know, as it concerns preaching, there's discussion sometimes about what preaching is. The main aspect of preaching is to publicly declare something. In this case, to publicly declare the gospel. But does it always have to be behind a pulpit? You know, Jesus most most of the time didn't have a pulpit. If he did, it was in a synagogue. Uh, and so it doesn't have to be behind a pulpit. It doesn't have to be on a street corner. You don't have to be a street preacher or a pastor or evangelist, okay, or an apostle to preach the gospel. You know, preaching the gospel can be in the backyard across the fence with your neighbor. And you are publicly announcing, but it's in a private situation. And and the, the same, I believe, could be said even with, with texting on a phone, okay? If you are texting someone, but you're announcing to them and proclaiming them to them the gospel, I believe, this is just my opinion, I believe that falls under the category of preaching. And so preaching Again, the main use of it biblically is to publicly announce with a, a group of people there. But we do see examples of preaching. For example, Philip in Acts chapter 8 when he was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, hopefully you get the point. Now you can see that other note on the screen there. Preaching is the main method God has chosen to bring the gospel to the world. And that's so important to understand because especially the world that we're living in today with the church, that, that in general, again, this is just a general statement, there's so many in the church, the body of Christ, that look down on preaching, that view preaching as an old-fashioned thing that we don't do today. You know, now we just, we, we, we lecture or we, we, we give a speech, we talk to people. And that's kind of the, the terminology that's in style today. But I just want to declare to you that preaching will always be the main method that God has chosen to bring the gospel to the world. A preacher may call it a lecture or may call it a talk, a conversation, or something else. But if it's publicly announcing the gospel and the word of God, then it is preaching. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul writes, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So the way that Paul described it in that verse is that not only is the gospel foolishness, but even the method of preaching to bring the gospel is foolishness. All right, the next thing we're going to take a look at, which is so important, is that you can see on the screen, it's a question, what did Jesus preach? We're going to take a look at that in the four Gospels, and you can see number one, the first thing that we see in the Gospels that Jesus preached was repentance. And repentance means a change in spiritual direction. It's being sorry enough for one's sin to change direction. And I'll add, I'll add this thought to it. Repentance is really an action of the heart. It's doing a 180 in the heart, and you're going one direction of sin, but when you repent, 
You believe in the gospel and you go the opposite direction. You're going the, a 180 direction from your sin towards Jesus. That is true repentance. And that's what Jesus preached. You can see it there. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another scripture, Matthew chapter 11, uh, 20 through 24, it says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Then he said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades or hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You know, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus pronounced a woe on those three cities of, of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And I've dealt with it in an earlier video. Those three cities were in Galilee, and about 60 to 85 percent of all of Jesus' miracles were done in those three cities. And they did not repent in general. There were some, of course, but in general, of all of those miracles that were done and the power of God and the kingdom of God manifested to those people in those areas, they did not repent. And Jesus said that because they did not repent. And so my point is, is that Jesus preached repentance to them. All right, the next thing that Jesus preached was the gospel of the kingdom. Now, what does that mean? It refers to the good news that the Messiah had come to rule. And that means rule primarily over sin and Satan and rule in our hearts as the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So again, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Is it separate from the gospel? Well, the word gospel, as we'll deal with in just a moment, it means good news. And so the gospel of the kingdom, it means it's the good news that the Messiah had come to rule. Now, do we still preach the gospel of the kingdom? Absolutely yes, okay? Because Jesus has come, and he's still come to rule in the hearts and lives of people. As you can see in the screen, I'm going to give you the, the Greek word and meaning for the word gospel. As you can see there, the Greek word is the word euangelion. That's how it's pronounced, euangelion. It means simply good news. The word gospel is used 70 times in the New Testament. That's a lot. And then the word kingdom is the Greek word basileia, and it refers to royal power or dominion and rulership. And I'll take myself on the screen here. The, the kingdom of God refers to the rule and power of God through the King, Jesus Christ, and his cross. And so Jesus brought forth and he preached the gospel of the kingdom. And you know that word, uh, basileia, maybe you've heard of the word uh, basilica before, okay? Basilica is a building, and it comes from that Greek word basileia, referring to royal power, dominion, and rulership. I want to bring out some more scriptures that deal with the gospel of the kingdom. It says in Luke 17, 20, 21, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. See, that was huge for, for the Jews of old and for us to understand today. You see, they were understanding the kingdom of God as simply a physical kingdom in which the Messiah would be a political and physical ruler 
that would make Israel the greatest nation on the face of the earth. But Jesus made the point that the kingdom of God is not in that way, okay? It's not an observation. Look at that. Look over there. No, he said the kingdom of God is within us. And remember what the kingdom of God is. It's the rulership of God through the person and the work of Jesus Christ in the hearts of people. So to you today, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in our heart. King Jesus reigning on the inside. All right, Romans 14, verse 17. It says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, or that is laws or rules, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And then Luke 11, and verse 20. Jesus said, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that word finger of God refers to the power of God. So Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God about 103 times in the Gospels. And it's been said before, and I think it's true, that he spoke about the kingdom of God more than any other thing in all of his ministry. Okay, whether it's preaching or teaching, he spoke about the kingdom of God really more than anything else. Again, 103 times in the Gospels. All right, we're going to move on to the next thing that Jesus preached, and it was this. The time is fulfilled, which what does that mean? The time is fulfilled. It means the time of the promised Messiah, whom he was, had come. Let me say it again. The time is fulfilled means the time of the promised Messiah had come. In Mark 1 verse 15, Jesus came preaching, the time is fulfilled. And you can see that second bullet. All of the Old Testament prophecies of the first coming of Christ had finally come. And there were about 300 Old Testament prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the Jews of old then and even today, they didn't understand a first coming and a second coming. The disciples, they wouldn't understand that until after the resurrection. And so when Jesus preached the time is fulfilled, what he was saying is all of the prophecies of the Old Testament about my coming, they've come to pass and and, and they're being fulfilled right before your eyes. And I should say again, the prophecies about the first coming of Jesus, because there are other prophecies about the second coming of Christ that have not come to pass yet. But Jesus came preaching, the time is fulfilled. All right, the last thing that we see in the Gospels that Jesus preached was believe in the Gospel. And that just is very simple. It means to put one's faith in Christ and his redemption plan. And the word believe is the Greek word pistis, and it means to believe, faith, trust, to rely upon. It refers to dependence. I I often use the word depend in my preaching and teaching because the word faith sometimes, uh, the meaning of it can be lost because we use it so often. Because that word faith or believe, it does mean to trust, to rely upon, to depend upon. And that's what real faith is, to put one's dependence in Christ and God's redemption plan through him. And so Jesus preached, believe in the gospel. Now, as we close this video, I want to focus on this, as you can see in the screen, that in everything that Jesus preached, in those four things, he only required two things, and that is repentance and faith. Again, he preached repentance. He preached, you have to believe in the gospel. So again, in everything that Jesus preached, he only required two things, repent and believe. And you know what? Those two things are required today to be truly born again. You have to repent of your sins and do that 180, return from your sin and turn to the truth in the person and work of Jesus. And and you have to believe. Okay, faith, depend upon who he is and what he's done. And it's very simple. Just believe that he died for your sins and he rose from the dead. And so in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And that goodness of God ultimately was manifested at the cross and Jesus laying down his life for us. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 
10, it says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You see, the goodness of God leads us to repentance, but also godly sorrow leads us to repentance. And what is godly sorrow? Godly sorrow is basically us seeing our sin in light of the goodness of God, in light of the love that God has towards us as sinners. And that produces a godly sorrow. And then in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, those two things will always be the two main things that God requires for a person to be saved. Believe and repent. Believe and repent. All right, that is the preaching ministry of Jesus, and that's where we're going to end this video, a little bit shorter than the others, but I pray that you've been blessed. I believe that you have, and so God bless you, and have a wonderful day in Jesus.